I am Michael Hussey, Dean at Widener Law Commonwealth. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the third and final session of our fifth annual Veteran Services Program. The law school and the university have a long tradition of serving veterans, dating back to our time at, as the, univer, the university's time as the Pennsylvania Military College. At the law school, we have a veterans initiative to support our veteran law students. The initiative provides to each veteran academic, career, and financial support tailored to that veteran's unique needs and experience so that each may become a successful attorney. Thank you to Professor Kristen Johnson, Joy Boudreau, Brian Fernball, Paula Hyder, the AOPC, and everyone else involved for all of their hard work in conceiving and coordinating this program. I hope that you find today's session informative. Thank you all for joining us. Next, we have a short video from Justice Deborah Todd of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Good morning. It is my privilege to welcome you to Widener University Commonwealth Law School's fifth annual Veterans Services Program. Thank you, Professor, former Dean, Christian Johnson, for once again extending an invitation to me to greet your online attendees. Thanks also to Dean Michael Hussey and the Law School Administration and Faculty for your dedication and continued support of our veterans. I would like to acknowledge Angela Lowry and Andy Simpson from the Administrative Office of Pennsylvania Courts for their assistance in coordinating this program. I would also like to acknowledge all of the distinguished panelists participating in the program. Michael Carrington, Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, Richard Pajeski, Pennsylvania Board of Probation and Parole, Joanne Tresco, Sergeant Major, retired, Pennsylvania Army National Guard, Earl Granville, retired Staff Sergeant, Army National Guard, Maureen Weigel, Brigadier General, Pennsylvania, Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. Jeanette Krolzik, Pennsylvania Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, and Governor's Advisory Council for Veterans Affairs. Finally, thanks to all of you for your continued support of justice for veterans. I bring you greetings from Chief Justice Baer and all of my colleagues on the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. It is my honor to continue to serve as the Supreme Court's liaison to Pennsylvania's Veterans Courts. While I am not a veteran, I am married to retired U.S. Army Colonel Steve Todd, and we share a deep commitment to our Pennsylvania Veterans Court program. I'm proud of my husband's 29 years of military service, six and a half years of which were on active duty and which included activation during Operation Desert Storm. Steve presently serves as the mentor coordinator in Butler County Veterans Court. As Americans, we owe a debt of gratitude to our military veterans. And our Supreme Court is committed to doing everything we can to support the men and women who have served our country as they transition back to civilian life. As you all know, many veterans struggle with the readjustment to civilian life. Pennsylvania has the fourth highest population of veterans in this country, nearly 800,000, and their struggles affect all of our communities. It is estimated that 17 to 20% of our young vets suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, or major depression. Yet only half of these vets seek treatment. Others resort to self-medication with drugs and alcohol, which often leads to their involvement with the criminal justice system. It has been estimated that one third of America's homeless are veterans. On any given night, over 23,000 veterans are unsheltered or living on the streets. The majority of those suffer from substance abuse, mental illness, or related disorders. Veterans who are homeless 
have a higher prevalence of criminal justice system involvement. About half of all veterans experiencing homelessness who have participated in the VA Homeless Assistance Program are involved in the justice system. Sadly, an average of 18 veterans commit suicide every day in the United States. Pennsylvania's Veterans Treatment Courts provide access to justice for veterans in our Commonwealth. Building on the problem-solving court model, eligible veteran defendants with substance dependency and or mental illness are placed on a specialized criminal docket. These courts combine treatment and personal accountability with the goal of breaking the cycle of addiction and criminal behavior. After initial screening and assessment, these veterans are offered an opportunity to participate in this voluntary program. It involves judicially supervised compliance with a treatment plan developed by veteran healthcare professionals. Compliance is monitored through regularly scheduled court hearings, during which participants may be sanctioned for non-compliance and rewarded for a job well done. Similar to the protocol in drug treatment courts, veteran participants progress through the program by moving through phases. Veterans courts emphasize a team-focused approach through collaboration and cooperation among judges, treatment providers, and veteran volunteer mentors. At graduation, successful participants have become stable, employed, and substance-free and continue to receive mental health care through community and peer counseling groups or the VA. We currently have 25 veterans courts in Pennsylvania. Two other courts, Luzerne and Wyoming Sullivan counties, provide a veterans track in their adult drug and or DUI courts. Nearly 2,000 veterans have completed the rigorous one and a half to two year program and have graduated from Pennsylvania Veterans Courts. Successful Veterans Courts boast impressively low recidivism rates and save countless tax dollars by keeping our veterans out of prison. Veteran Courts provide access to justice for Pennsylvania veterans and they truly help our veterans find their way back home. Dean Hussey, best wishes for a successful program. And to all of our veterans tuning in today, I thank you for your service. Justice Todd, thank you so much for your unwavering support over the, the last five years of our program and for all the great work that you do for veterans. It's my pleasure now to introduce Andy Simpson, who's the Judicial Programs Administrator at the AOPC. And I'll turn the time over now to Andy and, and for his panel. Uh, welcome, uh, and thank you, Christian. And thank you for uh, attending uh, this session today, our fifth year running with this uh, program. Um, I'll be moderating today's pan panel. I work for our Judicial District Operations and Programs Department here at the Administrative Office uh, for Pennsylvania Courts. Um, we wanna thank all military men and women for your service to this country. Uh, and a big thank you to Widener and Justice Todd for your continued support uh, for these important programs. If you have any questions during today's panel uh, discussions, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, we can answer them after each panelist. We can answer them also at the end of uh, uh, the session today. Uh, but today's topic is access to justice for uh, veterans, efforts and outreach by the Commonwealth. And with us, we have three distinguished speakers who are leading the way at the state level. We have Angela Sobel Lowry. Uh, she's the state problem solving court administrator for the Administrative Office of Pennsylvania Courts. And Angela will discuss uh, the veterans programming and problem solving court efforts here in the state. After Angela, we have Jeanette Krolvik. She's the coordinator for the Governor's Advisory Council for Veteran Services. Uh, and she'll discuss their efforts uh, with the Advisory Council. And to close today's session, we have Joel Mushler, uh, the director of Bureau of Programs, Initiatives, Reintegration, and Outreach for the Pennsylvania Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, or the DMVA. Uh, he'll discuss what they're doing to reach and serve veterans uh, across Pennsylvania. All right, 
let's get uh, get to our first panelist, and I'll introduce Angela Sobel Lowry. She's our again our state uh, problem solving court administrator here in Pennsylvania. And she joined the AOPC in February of 2018. Prior to her appointment, Angela served as the drug court coordinator for the Baltimore uh, City Circuit Court Adult Drug Treatment Court, and was responsible for planning, managing, and uh, the daily operations of the drug court program in Baltimore. Before serving as coordinator of the drug court, Angela was the project coordinator for the Baltimore City Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. One of her major accomplishments was overseeing the planning and implementation of the Fugitive Safe Surrender Program, operated in conjunction with U.S. Marshal Service uh, to address the backlog of warrants in Baltimore City. She began her career as a juvenile probation officer here in Northumberland County, where she worked directly with youth involved in a criminal justice system. Uh, she holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from Susquehanna University and a master's degree in administration of justice from uh, Shippensburg. I've had the pleasure over the years to, uh, to assist Angela in my role here at the AOPC and excited to have her here on the panel today to share some of the exciting uh, projects we've been working on. All right, Angela, you're up. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about problem solving courts in Pennsylvania. And the first question, what is a problem solving court? Let's Good morning, everybody. Andy, thank you for that introduction. And I also just wanted to extend my thanks to Dean Hussey and Professor Johnson um, for the opportunity to co-host this event with Widener again. This is, uh, like Andy said, our, our fifth year and something we look forward to every year. And also extend my thanks to Justice Todd as well for her continued support of Veterans Treatment Courts. Um, she is just tireless in her efforts to support them across the Commonwealth, and we're so appreciative of that. Um, so as Andy said, I work for the Administrative Office of Pennsylvania Courts, or the AOPC, and we are the administrative arm of the Supreme Court, and we perform a lot of, you know, various functions for, for judges and courts across the Commonwealth. I work in our operations department specifically for problem solving courts, and so my team and I provide training and technical assistance to the treatment courts across the state. So to get back to answer your question, Andy, a problem, a problem solving court, which will also be referred to, you may, you may hear as a, as a treatment court, focuses on specific types of behaviors or conditions that are often linked to crime and social issues. So as many of you know, substance use disorders and untreated severe mental illness can have a major impact on our courts and our jails and our prisons. And so the goal of a problem solving court is to provide treatment and services to eligible participants suffering with substance use disorder and mental illness in an effort to get them stable and to change their behavior so that they can lead a sober lifestyle. Problem solving courts emphasize long-term recovery over, over punishment. And so we, they are very, they're very therapeutic in nature versus having your case process in the traditional way through the court system. Okay, great. Uh, you know, we're here today to talk about veterans uh, programming services in the state. What is a veterans treatment court? So a veterans treatment court is a type of problem solving court, and it's a rigorous 12 to 24 month program that assists justice involved veterans struggling with substance use disorder and mental health issues. And the research that's been done continues to draw a link between substance use disorder and combat related treatment, which left untreated can directly lead to involvement with the criminal justice system. And these issues are also exacerbated by the loss of structure and camaraderie, which is found in the military. And that's sort of how veterans treatment courts got their, got their start. They, they, they put that structure and camaraderie um, back into a justice involved veterans life. So as a participant in a veterans treatment court, the veteran interacts regularly with a judge, they attend treatment, they submit to frequent and random drug and alcohol testing, they report to probation, um, and they may receive other support services through the VA or other programs um, that may have that may have services in the county. A veterans treatment court model is very structured and veterans respond really favorably to this structure because of their past experience in the armed forces. One of the things that makes a veterans treatment court different from other types of problem solving courts is the mentoring component. Volunteer veteran mentors 
engage, they encourage, and they empower their fellow veterans to change their life and they support them throughout their time in the Veterans Treatment Court. So a volunteer veteran mentor will go to court hearings, they may provide transportation, they may um, they may link their, their mentee with other services within the, com within the community, but the, the justice involved veteran and their mentor, they share that they have a shared experience of being in the military together. And so the mentoring component reinstills that sense of camaraderie that the justice involved vet felt when they were in the military and they really exemplify the notion of leave no veteran behind. No, oh, thank you. Um, in, in Pennsylvania, how many veterans treatment courts are there like across the state? And like, what, when did these courts originate? So we currently have 25 veterans treatment courts in Pennsylvania. And as Justice Todd mentioned earlier, we have two counties that have a veterans track as part of their drug or DUI court. Um, the first veterans treatment court opened up in Lackawanna County in 2009. And then the, first, the Veterans Treatment Court model was first implemented in Buffalo, New York in 2008. So it's a fairly recent model in terms of Veterans Treatment Courts. Um, and I believe there are approximately 335 Veterans Treatment Courts across, across the country. So I really think as time goes on, more research comes out on these, on these courts and their effectiveness, I think we'll see these numbers expand. Okay, yeah, I know working with the Veterans Treatment Courts and with you over the years, I know 25 is among like the leaders, uh, you know, across the country um, in the states for Veterans Treatment Courts. So we have a lot of Veterans Treatment Courts in the state, but there are counties without a Veterans Treatment Court. Um, are veterans, is this the only way for justice of all veterans to receive services? like through a veterans treatment court? No, absolutely not. So at the magisterial district court level, a handful of counties have diversion programs for justice involved events that have low level summary offenses. The magisterial district courts are where the initial court interaction takes place. And so it provides the best opportunity to reach justice involved vets and to connect them with services. We recently launched, and recently as in two days ago, launched a veterans awareness poster campaign. And so posters are being placed in the lobbies of magisterial district courts to encourage justice involved veterans to seek support through county resources, whether that's a veterans treatment court, another type of diversion program or, or something else that might be available and to connect with their regional VJO. And VJO stands for Veterans Justice Outreach Specialist and they are employed by the VA and they connect eligible veterans with benefits and services through the VA. And so those services can include things such as substance use treatment as well as mental health um, counseling. So the other thing to keep in mind is that 54 out of 67 counties in Pennsylvania have a treatment court. So even if there isn't a veterans treatment court in your county, a veteran may still be eligible for another type of treatment court and, and can still receive services. Um, and again, they also there, there could be other services available in that county. Um, that's not a treatment court. Um, the other thing that's really important to note is that just because someone is a veteran, it doesn't automatically make them eligible for a veteran's treatment court. There is other types of eligibility criteria that needs to be met. There is a screening process um, and they look at criminal history and they'll look at clinical needs. Um, and so every, every veteran's treatment court has their own eligibility criteria. So not only do you need to be a veteran, but you also need to meet this other criteria in order to be eligible for uh, a treatment court. And so as I, as I said earlier, the, the best place to connect a veteran with services is at the magisterial district court level because that's the initial interaction. And it's so important that we it's crucial to get them connected with services at that, at that point. The, the sooner, the better. And that's why early identification is so important. Oh, th thank you. And going back to the, the mentor component uh, you discussed earlier, what if we have veterans in the audience here, what, what should they do if they're interested in becoming a veteran mentor for a veterans treatment court? How do they go about that? 
please reach out to us. Um, we have an email address, aopc.vtc at pacourts.us that we will, I'll stick in the chat box. Um, we, courts are constantly recruiting for veteran mentors. We have Unfortunately, there are more veterans court participants than there are veteran mentors available. So mentors are often mentoring two or three veterans at a time. So we need that volunteer veteran mentors. So please email us at that email address and we will connect you with the coordinator um, of, the, of the court that you're interested in working with. And then once you have that connection with the coordinator, they'll be able to answer any questions about the program as well as any um, eligibility or training requirements that they have to be a volunteer veteran mentor. But if I, I really encourage you to do it. We, we really need mentors. If you know of other veterans that would be interested in doing this, um, you know, please have them reach out to us. And one last uh, question that I have. I know working uh, with you, Angela, there's a lot of interest in veterans treatment courts across the state, you know, from maybe the district attorney's offices, the county commissioners who want to start a veterans court in their county or other officials. Uh, what would you tell them to do? Like, where should they start, like the process, if they're interested in their county? So if you're interested in starting a veterans treatment court within your county, you really need to start with your local president judge. You really need to make that connection with them um, before any treatment court court can get started. It needs to have the approval of the president judge. And once that approval is there, then that allows us to get involved and help with the planning process and help to move things forward. But you really need to start with your president judge to have that conversation. Um, in counties, or as I mentioned earlier, we have a few counties that have veterans tracks. So if there is a county that has limited resources, a veterans track is another possibility um, that's easily implemented within an already existing drug or, or DUI court. But before you do anything, we strongly encourage you to please reach out to your, your local president judge. And if you're not sure who that person is, use the email address that I'm going to put into the chat box and we'll be more than happy to connect you. And, and certainly any other questions that you might have, please feel free to direct them to that email address. That's the best way to reach us. No, thanks, Angela. That's, I mean, that's the end of my questions, unless you have anything else you wanna share uh, with the group. Um, if uh, there are no questions at this point, if you think of them, uh, enter those in the chat, we get to uh, answer those questions at the end. And, uh, you know, Angela's going to post the email address as well. Mm -hmm. But again, thanks, Angela. Um, we're going to move on to the next panelist. Um, next, we have Jeanette Prolvik, who is the coordinator for the Governor's Advisory Council on Veteran Services. Originally from Central PA, Jeanette graduated with honors from IUP with a bachelor's degree in technical theater. Uh, after working in theater for over seven years, she obtained her international teaching English as a second language certificate and diploma and moved to Indonesia, where she taught thousands of students conversational English at various locations. After being away for over a decade and visiting more than 16 countries, uh, geez, uh, Jeanette, you're quite the traveler. She became she came home and began working for the Commonwealth. Uh, Jeanette began her time with the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, working on requests for military records, and then as the Executive Secretary for the Deputy Adjutant General for Veterans Affairs over three years. And a little over a year ago, Jeanette was chosen as the coordinator for the Governor's Advisory Council on Veterans Services, where she coordinates a large scale uh, the large-scale quarterly meetings for the 24-member council interfaces with more than 19 different state agencies and assists the seven committees in their efforts to identify better needs and fills, uh, fills gaps for the Commonwealth service members, veterans, and their families. Jeanette is also a Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt and all, a member of the International Society of Female Professionals. I've personally had the honor and pleasure to, of working with Jeanette. She truly does. You do an amazing job, Jeanette, and uh, has, you've been a tremendous asset for the advisory uh, council. So without further ado, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome Jeanette. All right, Jeanette, uh, what are the current committees that are active right now with the Advisory Council? Well, thanks so much for that wonderful introduction first, Sandy, and it's been a pleasure working with you and AOPC in general. You, you, you guys do an amazing job as well. Um, so yeah, the we have a lot of committees that, that currently work for the uh, Governor's Advisory Council and Veteran Services. So. <clears throat> the seven that we have right now are the Aging Committee, Homeless Committee, Health Promotions, Judiciary, 
which you serve on, uh, women veterans, education, employment, and workforce development, and veterans in public service. So just to give a little background to how this all fits together within the council, um, in 2013, the, the GACVS, as we call it, uh, was established by executive order and recently amended in 2019 to add a few more seats. So this 24 seat council is made up of primarily state agency heads. We get together quarterly and they basically receive a briefing from these committees. And each committee has obviously, as the, the name suggests, a specific niche. They focus on aspects that are important to the veterans community. And then these agency heads or their designees get together, listen to the briefings, and then figure out how we best go forward and make adjustments and uh, improvements for the veterans' lives. Yeah, great. Do, do these uh, committees ever change? Or I guess, how do the committees develop? New committees development. Yeah, um, there, there's a couple things that could happen with the committee. So yes, they do change over time. From the beginning, there have been changes. Um, and I've been only coordinating, as you mentioned, for a little over a year. So uh, some changes have happened before my time. Um, but some are created ad hoc. They could be generated for specific purposes as needed as things come up. Um, and they can also merge um, and, uh, and migrate you know, as the environment requires. So ultimately, any changes or adjustments um, that would result would be from guidance from our chairperson, who is currently our Deputy Adjutant General for Veterans Affairs, Maureen Weigel, um, or suggestions that come from the lower levels could be raised for that chairperson's approval. All right, and what's, what's an example of a committee initiative that has been completed? So a good one, um, a good one to describe came out of the aging committee. So, and this is a long term project. This, this took probably a year and a half to two years to develop as sometimes these things do take that long. Um, but over the past year, especially uh, the veterans pension poaching awareness campaign was launched. So unfortunately, uh, older Older veterans are a targeted population for scammers. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's never great news to hear that stuff, but those things happen. Um, so when veterans need to file for benefits, they should always go to an accredited veteran service officer to help them with that process. And it's completely free. But some groups out there, you know, they tell veterans that uh, you have to pay for that service or they tell them, oh, I'll help you file, but then I get a cut of whatever money comes into you. Um, so number one, that's unethical behavior. And number two, um, you know, for people who are older and are on a fixed income, that's a serious issue. It's, it's a big problem. So to mitigate that challenge, uh, the aging committee put together a digital toolkit and messaging uh, that was all packaged, and it was sent out to 31 participating entities. And those entities were among mainstream human service and healthcare providers that interface with veterans, among other people, but they know that, you know, older Pennsylvanians are sometimes veterans, and they ask those questions to make sure that they're getting um, the information they need. So the entities, um, you know, they, they had a, a big aha moment, you know, they understand this is a big problem now, you know, just the awareness is a huge uh, help. So every June now for Elder Abuse Awareness Month, the aging committee is planning on deploying that message to keep it relevant. And hopefully one day we can eliminate that problem altogether. No, that would be good. Um, any parting words you'd like the audience to have? Yeah, one thing that we always mention at our quarterly meetings um, is that we always want to make sure our veterans are counted. So uh, as mentioned in the video from, um, from Justice Todd, we know that uh, Pennsylvania has the fourth largest population. We have almost 400,000 veterans. Uh, I'm sorry, almost 800,000 veterans. And we don't have the ability to directly communicate with many of them uh, to give them veteran specific information. So we have the PA Veterans Registry. Um, <clears throat> uh, I was going to say, I have the, the website here. So it is www.register.dmva.pa.gov. I'll make sure that's uh, communicated as well in the chat. But this is... Um, it's a great way to connect with individuals, whether they're veterans or whether they assist veterans. Um, when you sign up for the registry, you can opt into our digest. It's a weekly publication filled with all different types of veteran-centric information. 
and you do not need to be a veteran to sign up. So as mentioned, I'm not a veteran, um, but I'm married to a 21 year retiree. There's veterans in my family. So I'm on the registry. I've signed up for the digest and um, you know, if you're a spouse or a family member or caregiver or any type of advocate, feel free to register and sign up so that you can at least share that information with veterans in your life or your local community. So we always try to push that. It's a great way to get information out and to identify which of those individuals are veterans for communication. Thanks uh, for sharing, Jeanette. Um, sure. Jeanette's gonna, she's gonna post the, the registry uh, website in the chat uh, so you can uh, take a look at that. And if there are no questions right now, we could uh, come at, come back uh, to Jeanette later if there are questions at the end. Um, but again, thanks, Jeanette. You're doing some uh, amazing work on the advisory council. Um, and we're going to move on to our next panelist. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Jeanette to moderate and introduce your colleague. It's all yours, Jeanette. OK. So thanks so much for having me on today. Uh, this is a great opportunity to share some information. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Joel Munchler. So as mentioned, um, Joel is the director for the Bureau of Veterans uh, Programs, Initiatives, Reintegration and Outreach for the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. And um, just to give you a little background about Joel. Joel began his uh, extensive military career in 1997. He enlisted in the United States Air Force and he served on active, active duty for four years um, before he enlisted in the PA Air National Guard where he continued to serve until his retirement in 2015. During his tenure, he held multiple positions before being assigned to the DMVA Policy Planning and Legislative Affairs Office as a Legislative Affairs Specialist. He then accepted an appointment with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as the Executive Policy Specialist for the department. And in 2018, he was appointed to his current position as director that he serves in today. In the current role he has, he's responsible for the direction of comprehensive programs and initiatives focused on outreach, um, reintegration of those returning to civilian life, and extensive advocacy for the Commonwealth's veterans and their families. Joel is a 2009 graduate of Eastern University, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in organizational leadership, and a 2016 graduate of Grand Canyon University, where he earned a Master of Public Administration degree with an emphasis in government and policy. So uh, Joel and I obviously work closely together. We work at the same department. And I always say for, for the GAC VS and our, for the Bureau, you know, the needs of our veterans are many and we are not funded to do everything um, that we hopefully would want to do for our veterans, which is why we have the council, which is why we do this outreach. We have to think creatively about solving problems for veterans. So Joel, I'll turn it over to you now. Um, and I'd like you to share some information basically about the Bureau at large um, and, and see how we, we kind of solve those problems or attempt to. Thanks, Jeanette. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we've got a very long title for the Bureau, uh, and uh, it's probably the longest in state government, I think, actually. Uh, but it really just boils down to a team of veteran advocates that are working each and every day uh, to meet the needs uh, of our veterans community. Uh, so within the Bureau, we've got uh, our state pro veterans programs that we manage. Uh, so, for example, our Veterans Temporary Assistance uh, Program, which offers up to a 1600 uh, emergency grant for emergency needs. Uh, our Real Estate Tax Exemption Program that offers 100% service connected disabled veterans, uh, real estate tax exemption. We also have a Blind and Veterans Pension, uh, Amputee and Paralyzed Veterans Pension, Educational Gratuity, and, and, and several other programs. What I want to focus on today is the our PA Vet Connect. Uh, this is a brand new program for the department, relatively. Uh, it's almost coming up on a year um, uh, of uh, being a, a program of record. So we kicked off uh, last November, Governor Wolf uh, came out and, and uh, launched PA Vet Connect, which we'd actually had started working prior to uh, the whole uh, pandemic. Um, and then of course, uh, throughout the pandemic, it certainly uh, brought to light the need that we needed to uh, better connect uh, with our veterans. And we can't do it from a state level. Uh, it's, uh, uh, to me, that's a falsity. We need to be in community. We need to be able to reach out and be able to connect with folks in community. So what we did is we broke the Commonwealth down into five regions. 
uh, basically a uh, picture map of the Commonwealth. Uh, you got the northwest, southwest corner, the central, the T, uh, northeast, and uh, southeast. Uh, and then within each one of those uh, regions, we have hired regional program outreach coordinators, uh, one per region, uh, as well as a regional veteran service specialist. And these, the staff, their main focus is to build relationships and break down communication silos. So this goes into the work that we're doing with the GAC BS and that uh, Jeanette's doing a fantastic job in, in, in coordinating there. Um, and so what we have found uh, over the last year or so is that this is working and it's working well, uh, simply because we're amplifying what's already being done out there in the community. So over the past, uh, this past uh, state fiscal year, we uh, were able to collaborate with our federal partners, our community partners, and we reached over 270,000 veterans and their family members. Uh, that was a first uh, for DMVA. Uh, the virtual environment allowed that to happen, uh, and it's something that we're going to continue to try and replicate. Uh, additionally, uh, we've had over 13,000 uh, connections uh, within uh, PA Vet Connect uh, as we continue to develop our information and referral tool. Uh, so this information referral tool is just that, it's for the toolbox. Uh, but we started out with 799 after we came out of proof of concept uh, into now over uh, 1,600 resources that are in that database. And that runs the gamut of um, homeless uh, organizations that are working with homeless veterans, organizations that are working with justice-involved veterans, organizations that are working for employment, so forth and so on. The need here is when we bring somebody to the table and we're sitting down with them with a, with a veteran service officer or a social worker, we want to make sure that that individual has got the tools that they need to meet the need of the veteran that is sitting in front. So I'm just going to give one, uh, one or two examples here uh, so we can dive into some questions. Uh, but our regional program outreach coordinators uh, just recently, this may seem like a small, uh, a small thing. But we had a VFW post out there that uh, was looking to build a um, uh, add on to their post and figuring out how they could make connections uh, and develop resources uh, with the local vet center. And our regional program outreach coordinator jumped in there. We're able to come alongside that post commander and really be able to engage in developing some long term strategies to meet the need of that post. What Two effects there. One, it increased their membership because the veterans in that community were saying, hey, DMVA gets it uh, and, OPA, and the VFW gets it. You know, the, our newer veterans are not ones that want to go to the post and hang out and uh, drink beer and so forth and so on. They want to go there. They want to learn things. They want to get out to the community. This offered an opportunity for us to help out the local post while also engaging uh, with the community. Another example, uh, you know, we've talked about uh, suicide. Uh, suicide prevention has been a hot topic. We just came out of the month of September, which was Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And we've been working uh, with the Northwest Suicide Prevention Program uh, to develop uh, um, interventions within uh, our, what we call PA Vet Connect Region 1, so the Northwest uh, corner of the state. Uh, and our regional program outreach coordinator is actively engaged every day with the University of Pittsburgh. Um, uh, and uh, developing this program. We're getting close to launching uh, out there. Uh, and really the whole heart to that uh, program is ensuring that, again, resources are there before it gets to, before it's too late. Similarly, up in the uh, northeastern uh, side of the state, we've been working with, together with veterans, uh, both in Green and Cambria counties. Or excuse me, that's, a, that's just launching together with veterans in Green and Cambria. But in, um, oh, Jeanette, help me. Uh, just lost the name of the county hey, when that happens. But uh, north uh, northeast corner of the state, uh, we've Is it got Lackawanna. Uh, one of them, yes. So we've got the uh, counties out there that are really having some issues in, in the in the uh, uh, Carbon County, excuse me, Carbon County, having a real issue uh, with uh, veteran suicide. And so we partnered with together with veterans to reach out to rural uh, community and develop. Uh, community connections to ensure that we're catching veterans before they uh, turn down that dark path. Um, 
what are we doing with uh, the folks uh, with our veteran service units? This is a this is a pride and joy for me, honestly. Is so our veteran service units throughout the the state corrections institutions, we're engaging with those uh, with the SCIs and, and with the uh, Department of Corrections weekly, uh, and engaging with the those uh, justice involved veterans, the inmates that are are, are within uh, the state corrections system. Uh, it's a huge uh, outreach opportunity for us to ensure that when they're coming. Uh, back into society that they're not going back to prison. Uh, so in short, that is uh, what we're doing with uh, our outreach. Really bottom bottom line to this is uh, PA Vet Connect is all about building connections to meet the needs of our veterans community. Uh, and I just thank each and every one of you uh, for the, the fact that you're here today and, and learning about what we're doing in the veterans space. Um, and uh, Jeanette, I'll flip it back to you. Thanks, Joel. I've got a couple questions for you. Um, so I know uh, I've mentioned veteran service officers, and so did you um, in our work with with outreach and and filling gaps and making sure people get what the what they need. So would you be able to kind of explain to everybody listening what exactly a veteran service officer does? Absolutely. So we've got the, the veteran service officers are really our, our boots on the ground. If you are advocates that are out there in community, whether they're working. Uh, for the county as the county director for veterans affairs and their staff or working for veteran service organizations, uh, American Legion, VFW, and vets and so forth, uh, to really meet the needs of the veteran community. So it really can break down into four areas, outreach, case management, a navigator, and an advocate. So from the outreach perspective, uh, they're really focused in on and getting out there and bringing information to veterans and helping us locate them across the Commonwealth. We've got a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of territory to cover that we can't do ourselves. So it's great that we've got team member, members out there in the community that can make that happen. The case management side of the, the house, uh, they're working to or uh, traveling to the veteran and assisting them with their federal benefits. So accreditation training is huge. Uh, so all of our uh, veteran service officers here at the MVA, as well as those that are working for the counties, and those working for the veteran service organizations are accredited and take uh, uh, do have CLEs that they need to complete, or excuse me, CEUs that they need to complete, as well as um, annual training uh, to maintain that accreditation uh, with the federal VA uh, and with the MVA. And the navigators really boils down to knowledgeable of the benefits and requirements of multiple levels, levels and building relationships with those community partners. And that's where PA Vet Connect comes in. When we built PA Vet Connect, we wanted to make sure that these advocates had a lifeline, if you will, that when they're sitting down with a veteran that may be experiencing uh, food insecurity or homelessness or a drug addiction, that they know that they could pick up that phone immediately, grab somebody on the other end, uh, and get connected to, to the resources to help the veteran. So in short, those veteran uh, service officers uh, are our best assets out there across the Commonwealth to meet the needs of our veterans community. Thanks, Joel. And I, I definitely uh, agree that they are the boots on the ground. They're doing some hard work every single day and advocacy is a steady drumbeat. So we need those people out there, you know, kind of knocking down the door of, of whatever the challenge may be. Um, you mentioned uh, veteran suicide. Obviously, that's a hot button topic, especially in the last few years. It's gotten a lot of attention as it as it should. Um, so you mentioned the Northwest and the Northeast, you know, what we're doing in, in different areas. But how is DMVA in general working to prevent veteran suicide? Any other areas that uh, we're kind of focusing on veteran suicide that you haven't mentioned? Thanks, Janet, for that question. So yes, I, I think one of the ones I do want to bring out is our governor's challenge to prevent suicide among service members, veterans, and their families. This is a priority for Governor Wolf. Uh, veteran suicide is a, we're, Pennsylvania is an anomaly and not in a good way or an outlier and not in a good way in that we've got a higher rate of suicide, veteran suicides in the Commonwealth than, than elsewhere across the country. And we have got to meet this challenge head on, this crisis head on. Uh, and so the governor's challenge uh, is bringing together stakeholders from the federal government, state government, county, uh, as well as nonprofit organizations uh, working with the VA, VA and SAMHSA and coming together to figure out how we can address these needs um, and ensure we're getting the resources where they need to be. Additionally, we've worked with the Department of uh, Drug and Alcohol Programs, uh, where we were able to capture about $2 million in state opioid uh, response grant funding to 
distinctly meet the needs of the veterans community um, and ensure that those community partners that were assisting us were able to address those co-occurring conditions uh, that complicate and often lead to uh, suicide or suicidal ideations. Uh, and I did mention the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, that's the program evaluation and research unit at Peru that we're working with on the Northwest Suicide Prevention Program there in 15 counties of Region 1. And then together with veterans, as I noted, that's the local and regional behavioral health professionals and advocates that are coming together to meet the needs uh, within rural Pennsylvania. Uh, as you can imagine, one of the, one of the areas that really uh, is an area for improvement for us is really connecting in rural Pennsylvania and being able to meet those needs. And, and uh, uh, that is one, one program that I could point to and say, hey, they, this, is, this is working very well. Uh, additionally, we're also working with our community engagement program coordinators with the, the uh, uh, VA medical centers that are across the state. Each one of them have a, the, the CEPCs that are attached to those VA medical centers. And interestingly, the, the CEPC job description and the one that we have for our POX kind of mirror each other um, in many ways, but the CEPCs are focused in on uh, suicide prevention. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I shared that document with the, with the feds and I think they stole it, which is good. Uh, you know, we're, we're all about sharing and allowing the feds to benchmark off us when they can, right? So, uh, but very excited about what we're doing in this space to, to meet this crisis head on. Excellent. Um, okay, so another question about uh, justice involved veterans. That's another topic that we we spent a lot of time talking about over the last couple of years. So there's been a lot of effort around that topic, and we hear a lot about the state facilities, but what services or um, what things are provided maybe at the county level? So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna pick on Allegheny County uh, as an example. So Allegheny. Um, has a, a jail pod within their, their county jail that mirrors what we're doing uh, within the, the, the correctional institutions. Um, and uh, our staff uh, here at DMBA, uh, along with the County Director for Veterans Affairs out there, Dwight Badler, have been going in and, and working with those, uh, those inmates and, and, and uh, getting them to where they need to be and getting them back out to community. But that's, that's a small example of what's happening there in one county of where they're making a difference. Um, and we're seeing that uh, other counties are looking at this model as well uh, and benchmarking what's being done with those veteran service units and, and developing these pods. And we're, we come in uh, with DMVA as we're a resource. Uh, if uh, the, the county needs assistance, uh, no, matter, no, no matter the space, we're there. We're gonna, we're gonna help connect those county leaders to the services that they need to meet the need of those, the veterans they're trying to serve. Um, and the, the big foot stomper for me is just ensuring that the, um, that everybody's aware of those county directors of veterans affairs that are there in, in community, 67 counties, 67 county directors of veterans affairs, um, that are really pivotal, uh, in, uh, making these connections. Um, so I do encourage folks to, to reach out to those county directors when, when help is needed, um, and especially uh, like I said, when we've got justice involved veterans, uh, I could give you uh, several examples of where uh, these county directors, as well as veteran service officers, the orange will jump in their cars and go to a location uh, when a veteran um, ha has been uh, at that initial point when they're getting becoming justice involved. Uh, some of, several of them have relationships with local law enforcement that help them uh, engage at that point so that uh, hopefully things don't uh, escalate. That's a good point too. the county directors for veterans affairs every county has one and they are worth their weight in gold so uh, absolutely wonderful resources. I have one more question for you Joel. Um, in talking about the veteran service organizations so those VFWs, <clears throat> excuse me, the American legions that you mentioned, how does DMVA interact with those groups exactly in supporting veterans needs. So the state veterans commission is made up of leaders from all of the veteran service organizations across the state as well as uh, four members at large uh, and we work the state veterans commission as an advisory body to the dmva uh, and we collaborate with them quite frequently on uh, initiatives that they're, they're working uh, locally um, our regional program outreach coordinators and our veteran service officers 
are connecting with uh, the leaders at the uh, lower levels, if you lower levels, if you will, so the district leaders and the coastal level, um, to really engage their community. Um, additionally, through the Veteran Service Officer Grant Program or exit the exit six of two thousand seven, uh, allows us uh, to provide grant funding to those veteran service organizations that are uh, hiring uh, accredited service officers. Uh, to be as force multipliers right, and helping us meet the needs uh, out there in community um, and really approaching everything from uh, this one VA concept, if you will. Uh, the end state that we're all looking to do, whether we're working with the American Legion, VFW, DMVA, AOPC, uh, or uh, practicing attorneys out there in community that are advocates for veterans, is really the end state we're trying to get to is serving that veteran. Um, and uh, that's where the commonality comes into play. And I'm grateful for the partnership that, that we have with those service organizations um, to help us uh, break down some of those trust barriers uh, that, that some folks do have. Because especially when I come in and do an engagement and I say, I'm, you know, we're here from the government, we're here to help. People are like, yeah. I'm like, I'm kidding. That's really, we're, we're here to help. But we're more about building those relationships and amplifying what's already being done in community. I can't replicate um, in DMVA, we, we cannot simply replicate what's already being the great work that's already being done in community, like hosting events like this one today to educate folks on, on what's happening in the veterans community. Excellent. Thanks, Joel. I don't see any questions coming through the chat, and that's all the questions that uh, that I had for you. Uh, so, Andy, I will toss it back to you. Thank you, Jeanette, and thank you, Joel, uh, for sharing today. It's You guys do impressive work over at the DMVA uh, to support all the veterans across the Commonwealth, um, so appreciate that. Um, I see no questions in the chat at the moment. Um, if you do have questions, uh, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or uh, type, in the, type those in the chat right now. Um, actually, one question came in from uh, David Vitell. Do we need to do anything to receive CLE credit? Okay, um, I'll let the administration handle that one um, for the event if you could type the answer in there, but I believe there's no CLEs for this uh, for this program this year. Um, so sorry about that, David. Um, are there uh, questions for our panelists uh, today? If you do, again, raise your virtual hand or type it in chat, um, or you can reach out you know, after the program as well. But we do want to thank, uh, I want to thank Angela, Jeanette, and Joel for your work and sharing on this panel today. It was a wonderful panel. Um, again, thank you to the Supreme Court, Justice Todd, Rhonda Campbell for your dedication and support. Rhonda, I know you're on this call, so thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone at Widener Law, Dean Hussey, Professor Johnson, Brian Fernball, Paula Heider, uh, Joe Bedreau, uh, Joy Bedreau uh, for putting on this event. Um, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, uh, so thank you for that, Brian. And uh, Paula uh, today. And again, a big thank you to Corinna uh, for your vision and efforts uh, for supporting this program from, from the beginning five, six years ago. Uh, without you, uh, this wouldn't be possible. So thanks, Corinna. And uh, thank you to everyone for attending today. And thank you to all the military men and uh, women uh, for your service. Um, I'll toss it back over to uh, Professor Johnson or Dean Hussey if you have any parting words, but um, thank you and take care. Well, Thank you very much. Uh, I thought the panel today was was very helpful and uh, in moving our mission forward to helping veterans here in, in Pennsylvania. And thanks to everyone again for attending this day and, uh, and, and have a terrific day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all.